them, Mom. I do. How much? Gobs and gobs. Dad, mm -hmm. do you love my brother? Connor? <laughs> I do. How much? Gobs and gobs. Dad, mm -hmm. do you love God? Yeah. How much? Gobs and gobs. Dad, uh -huh. do you love me? Hmm. Dad. <laughs> I do. How much? Um. I already know. Gobs, gobs and gobs. gobs. Yeah. Dad, mm -hmm. how much is a gob? Let me put it like this. Your favorite color is yellow. And when you eat those Nutter no Butter cookies, you always scrape the peanut butter out of the middle and you secretly feed it to the dog because you think the dog deserves a treat too. At nighttime, I know before you go to bed, you always pull your Barbies all together because you don't want them to be lonely. And sometimes when you get a little nervous, you bat your eyes like this, they get really, really, really fast. But when you're happy and when you're excited, you always twirl your hair right beside your ear. And you love your mama's red earrings. And you always seem to eat your green beans one at a time. <laughs> you see, my love, I notice you. And I love being your daddy. And I will always be here for you, even on your best days. Maybe on your worst days, your daddy loves you and will always be here for you. And that, my dear, that's what a gob is. I gob you too, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our service. My name is Brett Foster and I'm the marriage care pastor here at Willowdale. I'm so glad you're joining us today. And to our dads, granddads, uncles, and all our caring adult men who are watching, happy Father's Day. We're so thankful you invest into so many. Now, if you're tuning in for the first time or have recently joined our online community, we would love to know who you are. So please take a moment to visit our website. You can click the I knew button to learn more about us. And while you're there, fill out our connections card and tell us how we might help you get connected to our church family. Now, before we continue in our series, Reach, an invitation into God's mission, and hear a message from our Genesville campus pastor, Johnny Johnson, would you join me as we give God the honor and praise he is due and invite him to show us his heart for those around us as we sing.
Hey everyone, welcome to Willowdale Chapel's online service. My name is Johnny Johnston. I am the campus pastor at our Jennersville campus and so glad to have you with us, either watching or listening, however you're tuning in. And hey, if you're watching this on the weekend that we are releasing it, happy Father's Day to those of you who are are, uh, are celebrating Father's Day. We know that for some of us, this is a great joyous holiday. For some of us, it's hard, but we just wanna say happy Father's Day to all of you. Well, we are smack dab in the middle of a little three-part series called Reach, an invitation into God's mission, where we are talking about the three pillars of our local and global outreach, where we're talking about uh, gospel proclamation. We talked about that last week. Next week, we're going to talk about justice and mercy. And today, we talk about cultural engagement. Now, cultural engagement, this is a huge topic, like Books and books have been written about this topic. Entire sermon series have been preached about this topic. There is a lot to say about cultural engagement, and a lot of it has to do with this word cultural, or we'll even pare bear, bear, bear it back a little bit more, but just the word culture. I mean, how do you talk about culture in a succinct 30-minute sermon? How do you actually make that happen? I mean, there's a lot of you know, a lot of definitions, a lot of thoughts. When we say culture, do we mean pop culture? You know, do we mean like the culture of a team or a staff or a business, you know, or a locker room or you know, a school, a town? What do we mean when we say that? Do we mean uh, a culture of a particular people group? You know, like I just love the Irish culture. Like it could mean any of those things, but what does culture actually mean whenever we're talking about cultural engagement? Again, so many definitions, so many different theories, so many different thoughts about culture, how do we define it? Now, let me give you, hopefully this will help us narrow it down, a definition that I found for the word culture. Check this out here. It says, culture refers to the cumulative deposit of knowledge, experience, beliefs, values, attitudes, meanings, hierarchies, religion, notions of time, roles, spatial relations, concepts of the universe, and material objects and possessions acquired by a group of people in the course of generations through individual and group striving. There, that just cleared everything up, right? Oh, no, absolutely not. It just shows us how hard it is to, to define and talk about something like culture. Now, there was one word that I want to focus on in that definition. It's this word cumulative. What this means is that it's, it, it increases, it gets bigger as more and more things are added. And more and more things are added to our culture all the time. That's why if I were to ask someone, hey, could you describe American culture right now? Well, that would be so hard. There'd be some, I mean, I could ask 20 of you to do that and I would get 20 different answers. So most of them probably would at some point have the, the, the notion of, well, it's not that great right now because a lot of us don't feel like the American culture is really that great. But let's take even one deeper and bring it a little closer to home and church. What about the Christian culture of America? How do we define that? How do we talk about that? You know, a lot of us would acknowledge and say, and I'm sure you've heard this said, even if you don't necessarily believe it, that, you know, America is a Christian nation or it was founded on Christian values. And I would agree with you to some extent that there were at least some Judeo-Christian ideas that were around whenever we were, when the United States was getting started, when America was getting started. But sociologists now really across the board would say that we are now in a post Christian culture. Now, what does that mean? It means that Christianity is no longer the dominant religion. It's no longer this, this influence that it once was. You could do a survey, right? And you could actually probably find, and there would be surveys that would go against this notion, but there would be surveys that would actually say that there are, you know, 74% of Americans would say they're Christian. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is that Christianity is not this dominant influence of what it once was. And for a lot of us, we would say it's not this influence of what we would like it to be. Let me give you a little history lesson as to how I think we got here. And when I say little, I mean, we're going to be doing like a 3,000 foot fly, maybe not 3,000, that's pretty low, 30,000 foot fly over here. Uh, go back with me to the year 331, the Emperor Constantine, right, declared Christianity the national religion of Rome. Now, here's what was going on. A lot of people would say that that was actually a political move because in a roughly 300 years, Christianity went from about 120 people to 53% of the population. So some folks would say, well, Constantine realized that and realized, well, hey, if I want to get the majority here on my side, that's what I'll do. Now, 
I'm not making any claims about Constantine's soul. That's between him and Jesus. But at that time in 331, all those years ago, Christianity was the religion of the empire. It was, it was the dominant religion of the day. Now, fast forward, jump ahead to the 17th and 18th century in Europe, and we come to the Age of Enlightenment. Historians will look back and say this is when people started thinking differently and processing knowledge differently and talking differently, and a lot of things slowly started to change. This is where phrases like, I think, therefore, I am came out of, right? And then, so Christianity started to kind of slowly change, and as we, again, fast forward even more, a lot of historians and sociologists would say that Christianity has, has decreased in its influence really rapidly and dominantly in the last 30 years or so, the last two to three decades. Now, what's really interesting and fascinating about that for me and probably for you is that a lot of us remember that. You know, people will point to, the, to 1990, 1991, the end of the Cold War. And interestingly enough, this is when the term culture wars started to show back up again. It's a term from the 1920s, but it was brought back up in like roughly 1991. From 91 on to where we are today, Christianity has slowly declined in its influence and slowly declined in being this dominant part of society. And a lot of us remember that. Like in the 90s, it was like good to be a Christian. Now, maybe it doesn't feel like that so much. There have been so many things that have changed pretty rapidly in the last two to three decades. Uh, let, let me just, there's this great guy, his name's John Tyson. He's an author, pastor up in New York City. Um, and he says that there have been three major shifts that our culture has experienced. Let me just show you these shifts. We'll put them up on the screen here for you. The first shift is this. He said, we've moved from the majority to the minority, right? There's been a rise of people that people are calling the nuns, not like the nuns, the Catholic priests and the nuns, but N-O-N-E-S, that if you would fill out a survey, asked to, fill, to, fulfill out, or to fill out your religious affiliation, you would check off nuns. So there's been a rise of the nuns. From the center to the fringe, we used to be building schools and hospitals and doing these things in the center of culture. Now we are on the fringe and from respected to disrespected, you know, respected Christianity used to be respected. Now it's like, you're weird. Or to some people you would even say like, it's offensive or you're a dangerous individual if you were a Christian. Now Tyson said that these, these shifts came from these three things. They came from first secularization. 500 years ago, everybody believed in God. Right? It was unheard of to find someone who didn't believe in God. Now our culture is racked with doubt. Affluence, right? Uh, Post-World War II culture came with it money and pleasures. This is really where a lot of people say the birth of hardcore consumerism really came from. And the last is multiculturalism. Now, this is not a political statement. This is a historical statement. But with the post-World War II era, it opened the door to more and more refugees and more and more people coming in and other cultures outside of Europe. And so you would have people coming in from Africa or, or Asia or these other places. And so now all of a sudden, Hindu, Hinduism and Buddhism and, you know, all these other uh, religions started coming into the United States. Now, let me just say, I'm all for multiculturalism. I absolutely love it. I think it actually gives us a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God and what it will be one day. But along with that, with other cultures comes other challenges and other things. And so we've experienced these things. So these shifts came from these three things, secularization, affluence, and multiculturalism. And here's how the church, here's how the people of God have really felt impacted by that. Rick McKinley, author, pastor up in the Pacific Northwest area, I believe he's in Portland, wrote a book called Faith for This Moment. And he says, here's how this has impacted the church. It says, we have a loss of identity, right? Because we're now in the minority. We have a loss of place because we're in the margins and we have a loss of practice because our current practice doesn't even distinguish us from as different from everybody else in the United States. Now, these are some pretty big, if you would look at that image, that graphic, that slide with those nine things on there, we could look at that and we could be really sad when we think about culture and Christianity, or we could look at it this way. Here's how I want to choose to look at it. What an opportunity. What an opportunity we have right now. Because it's in these moments, in these times, in these places that historically Christianity has actually thrived. And this is an opportunity for us to trust in God more and believe in what he can do and has for us in this culture that we have found ourselves in, in this place that we are in. This is how Christians should react. We should look at this and say, 
We need to rely on God more and trust in God more. What a great opportunity we have. But how have Christians reacted? You know, for a lot of us, we separate. We separate out, right? We, you know, it's almost like, you know, if you can picture a hermit crab, right? When you come to a hermit crab, you try to pick it up and it just, it just sucks itself back into its shell and we just kind of fortify ourselves. And we, you know, there's this fortification process where we only talk to other Christians. We only do Christian things and have Christian friends and do all these different Christian activities. And we only do church things. A lot of Christians have done that. They separate out from society. Others have gone more of the kind of like the domination route where they're separating out from society. They, they dominate by, you know, this is where, again, culture wars or like, hey, I'm going to, we're going to take back America. America for Jesus, and they fight and fight and fight. So some people separate out, but there are others who accommodate, right? It's not so much of like the hermit crab with the shell. It's more of kind of like the chameleon, you know, just kind of blending in, right? We, we, there's, there's no difference. We've kind of waved the white flag in terms of what it comes to be a Christian because, you know, we might say we're a Christian or we'll go to church sometimes, but it has no impact on how we live our lives, we parent just like everybody else. We watch everything else that everybody else watches. We listen to everything else that everybody else is listening to. We just look like the rest of the culture and we forget what it means to have this separate, this, 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 this life where we're supposed to be uh, set apart, where we're, we're, we're called to be different by God. This is what Christians do, but how should they react? enter the biblical example of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is an Old Testament prophet. And one of Jeremiah's main jobs was to write and to communicate to the people of Israel, to the children of God, to the people of God, to tell them that Babylon, the superpower, was going to come to them and take them into exile, to pick them up and move them to from Jerusalem, from Israel to Babylon. Now, Jeremiah's message was not that it was just the superpower that was going to do this, but that it was actually God who was initiating this exile because the Israelites had broken their covenant promise with him. They had not been faithful in their relationship to God. And over and over again, they cheat on him and they turn their back on him and they worship other gods and they, and, and they, and they live and, and they are influenced too much by other cultures and forgetting their identity as the people of God. And this is Jeremiah's message. So in 598 BC, the first wave comes through and then the bigger wave of exile comes through in 587 BC. And just this large swath of people are exiled and taken to Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar. They leave their homes. They leave everything that they know. They leave this lush land that they absolutely love, the land flowing with milk and honey, right? That's what they were promised all those years prior. And now they finally had it, but they turn their back on God. And they're taken 700 miles across the desert to Babylon. Now, here's the crazy thing. They weren't taken there to be killed. They were taken there to be assimilated. They gave them new names. They gave them new clothes. They gave them new food. They gave them new jobs. And essentially, they gave them an entire new identity to grow the, the, the nation and kingdom of Babylon. That's what they wanted to have happen. And in the midst of all of this, there are false prophets who are also saying to Israel, this isn't going to last very long. This isn't going to take for it. Just, just don't unpack. Don't worry about it. God's going to come rescue us. We're his people. Why would he not come rescue us? And here's the letter that we have. We're finally getting to our text for today, right? A lot to talk about before we get here. From Jeremiah chapter 29, we're going to start just in verses 4 through the first part of chapter 10. Listen to these words. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. 
when 70 years are completed for Babylon. And let's pause right there. Okay, this is a letter from Jeremiah written to the exiles, to those that are in exile in Babylon. And just a few things before we look at the details of this letter. First, we see here that God is the one that sent them into exile, right? God has placed them there. That's something important. Also, we see at the end, right, there's these false prophets and God is saying, don't listen to them. Don't listen to what they're saying. In fact, when Babylon's complete, it's going to be 70 years. 70 years. In other words, you know, he's saying this is going to be a lifetime. Now, here's what's going on here. God, through Jeremiah, is trying to say to the people, here is the reality of what you are facing. He's giving them this realistic idea, this realistic vision that you are in this place. This is where I have put you and you are going to be here for a while. In other words, he's saying this is going to be the long haul. Now, interestingly enough, he doesn't make it sound like it's all punishment. It's not, is it all great? Well, no, they're, from, they're not in their homeland. They're not where they belong. They're not where they long to be. And yet, there, it's, and some of them would say like, how can, you know, there's, there's Psalms written about, how can we rejoice? We just, we just weep by the rivers here in Babylon. They long to be back in their homeland. But look at what God has told them to do in this culture, in this place. How are they to engage? He gives them kind of three major things that I want to talk about. The first is this. You'll see it on the screen here. He says to them, build houses and settle down. You see, he gives them a theology of place. In other words, you are not camping, right? He's saying, build a home, live in a neighborhood, get involved, be known. For us, we would say, get on the school boards, get in the PTAs, help build those playgrounds, get on the town councils, coach teams, don't withdraw, be in the mix with what is going on. You know, this is why we love working with ministries like The Garage in, in Kennett and also in Avondale, West Grove area. This is why we love Young Moms that came out of The Garage that is all over Southern Chester County. This is why we love ministries like Good Neighbors and Urban, Urban Promise who are in with the culture, in with the people, because they're building homes, literally, quite literally, for good neighbors. But they have a strong theology of the place to which they are called. Put down roots. Be here be in the mix. Don't shy away. Don't hide. He says, build homes, live in them. The second thing he says is this. He says, plant gardens. Plant gardens. Now, we could call this a theology of, of the economy, a theology of economy. In other words, what he's saying here is enter into the rhythms of the seasons, right? They're 700 miles away from home. They have to learn the whole new planting system. They have to learn the rhythm of the seasons. They have to learn the soil. They have to learn what grows there. They have to learn how to be successful. In other words, he's saying be a productive part of the economy. Be a productive part of the world and the culture to which you have been called. You know, we could say this in terms of our vocation. We, we'll, you, hear, you hear people talk about all the times, so what, what, what's your calling? What's your calling in life? Calling comes from the Latin word vox, V-O-X, and, and that's where we get the word vocation. How are you contributing to the economy is what God has called you to, the skills, the gifts that you have. We need to have a strong theology of the economy. We need to plant gardens and be active citizens in what is going on. We build houses, we plant gardens. And then he says this, he says, marry and have kids. And then we even says, you know, and, and their kids have kids. This is what we would call a theology of growth, right? He's saying, put down roots, put down roots. I mean, it goes with building a home and being in the mix, right? And, and, and learning the seasons and being a part of the economy. But he's saying, put down roots, grow your family here, right? A lot of us would say, or you've heard people say, I would never want to bring a kid into this world, into this life, into this culture. I mean, we can understand that. But what I want to question is the attitude behind that. Don't retreat. The attitude here. The, the position, the disposition that God has placed us in is one where we're to build houses, plant gardens, and grow, right? A theology of growth, a theology of the economy, and a theology of place is strong here. And all of this leads up 
to Jeremiah 29, 7. This is kind of our anchor verse for the day. Look at these words again. He says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Seek the peace, seek the prosperity. This could be welfare. This could be wholeness. This could be well-being. Seek the peace. You want this city to do well, to be strong. This is the, the Hebrew word shalom. It means wholeness. It means fullness. He's saying, seek this for this city, for this culture, for the place to which you have been called. Seek it. You want this. Here's how um, Eugene Peterson defines this. I absolutely love the way he defines this verse. He says, this is the dynamic, vibrating health of a society that pulses with divinely directed purpose and surges with life-transforming love. My goodness. The dynamic, vibrating health of a society that pulses with divinely directed purpose and surges with life-transforming love. Divinely directed purpose. Life-transforming love. That come from God. That come from us praying on behalf of our city. Seeking its peace and prosperity, its goodness, its shalom, its wholeness. This is what we are drawn to. This means that, that as we engage in culture, this is more than us just being good people, more than us just being a good person. And it's certainly more specific than us separating and accommodating. In fact, Jeremiah would say, you could read this and say, well, he's just saying just to assimilate, to accommodate into the culture, right? Build, plant, multiply. This, that's what everybody's doing. Well, no, he's not saying that. Why would God encourage them to do that? That's exactly what got them in this, this exile in the first place. He's not saying that. Seeking the peace and prosperity does not mean assimilating into the culture. It means banding together. It means adapting. It means being creative. It means being innovative. It means that we do all these things to bless the culture. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says it like this. It says, you have to have a strong link to the outside world while still being true to your faith. A strong link to the outside world while still being true to your faith. This means that we do everything that we can to develop wholeness in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our jobs, on the teams we coach that our kids play on, in the school board and PTA meetings that we're a part of. Everything we do is supposed to point to the wholeness, to the shalom of God. This is the reality of where these people find themselves. And this is the reality of where we find ourselves as well. Now, there's more to this passage. There's not just this reality, but there's also this hope, this long-term hope that comes. A lot of you are going to know at least one of these next verses that we read here. And Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of those famous verses. So let me start back with verse 10 to remind us of where we are. And we'll just read to verse 14. It says this, right? This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, then he says this, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a, a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Right? There is a future hope. One day God will come and return, and he will rescue them and return them to their homeland. The reality is that's where they are, and they're going to be there for a while. There's judgment, there's punishment, and God has every right to do those because the covenant has been broken. But God knows the plans that he has. He says it's going to be a while, but one day he will return. One day he will put us back, put them back where they belong, where they are supposed to be. So they live in this tension of this reality, knowing one day what will come. This is the tension that we have. Right, but Walter Brueggemann, who's an Old Testament scholar, he's just a, a, a biblical scholar, says this, that this is one of the most intense, powerful, and freighted announcements of return in all of Scripture. It's going to happen. There's this future hope. We have it. But right now, this is where we are to be. Now, what about us? What about us right now here in this moment? 
I'm just gonna make the claim again, because I'm going to agree, not only from observation, but also from research, that we live inside of a post-Christian culture. And cultural engagement is going to look different than what it once was. Here's what I want you to ponder. Here's what I want you to think about. Where are you separating from the rest of the culture? Now, don't hear me wrongly here. There are some places that we need to separate from. But given this call that we just read, this cry of God's heart, right? We can't separate out completely. Where in your life are you circling the wagons when, where you shouldn't be? Where in your life are you dominating and trying to fight back, whether it's against individuals or whatever you want to say it, or you've even burned bridges with people because you feel like you have to separate out so hard that you've actually lost influence with and relationship with the people that are in your life or the people that are around you? Where have you separated out? And how can these words in Jeremiah 29 speak to you about where you need to be? Now, I would say for a lot of us, we actually need to ask us more ourselves questions of accommodation. Where have we accommodated? Where have you blended in so much that no one even knows a difference about you? And they can't even tell a difference between you and the person down the road who has nothing or wants nothing to do with Jesus. Is it at work? Is it with your kids? Is it what we deem success in our world and in our culture versus what Jesus would say would be successful? Where have we accommodated? And what do these words in Jeremiah 29, what do they have to say to you? The question is, what parts of your life are you separating? Are you accommodating? And then what does it look like for you to actually seek the peace and prosperity of the city of the places where you have been called, where you have been asked to engage? Where are you spending your time? Where are you spending your money? What are you doing in your place? What does growth look like for you? What does economy look like for you? What does place look like for you? You have to ask yourself these questions and think about these things because here's the promise, right? God said to the Israelites after 70 years, this lifetime, I'm going to come back and get you. And when Brueggemann says that this is one of the most intense, powerful, and freighted uh, announcements of return on all of Scripture, I'm going to go out on a limb here, which is not really much of a limb, and say we actually have the strongest, most intense, powerful, and freighted returns promised to us. Because one day Jesus comes back. One day Jesus will return. He promises us this, and it says he will make all things new. Everything will be set right. Everything will be put in place the way that it is. So as we are engaging in the culture, as we are building homes in a theology of place, as we are planting gardens in a theology of economy and living our lives with a mission of God on our hearts and in our minds, as we are multiplying and growing and have this theology of proper level of growth, we are doing so pointing to the one day reality that Jesus will come again and make all things new and set everything right. That is why we do what we do. We are a part of the restorative, rest, uh, the, the restorative, redemptive work of Christ. We have been called to that as human beings, as individuals, and as a community, and as a church. And so what does this look like for you? What does cultural engagement mean knowing that one day we have the promise that Jesus will come back? And I'm, I dare, dare I say it, that I think these are the plans that God has for you. Right? We quote Jeremiah 29, 11 all the time. We write it on graduation cards. We put it on things and we think that it means God has this nice, laid out, comfy, perfect little plan for us. But in reality, what this means, the plan that God has for you is engaging in the culture, is building, planting, and growing and pointing to the one day return of Jesus the hope that we have in Christ. And it could be hard and it could be uncomfortable and it could be difficult because we are living in a post-Christian hostile culture. But how do we seek the peace and prosperity of the land to which we have been called? How do we pray to the Lord for it? Because as it thrives, as it prospers, we also prosper. We also thrive because this is where God has placed us. So here's my encouragement to you. Write Jeremiah 29, 7 
somewhere, a post-it note on, a, on an index card, make it the background of your phone, somewhere where you're gonna see it, hang it on your refrigerator, put it in your car, up, uh, up on your cabinets, on your desk, whatever this looks like. Write out Jeremiah 29, seven and memorize it. It's not that long. Memorize this verse and then pray to God to ask you what it looks like for you, for your family, for our church, for our community, to seek the peace and prosperity, to engage in the culture in such a way where we show people what the love and grace and beautiful peace, the shalom of Jesus looks like. Can you do that? Jeremiah 29, seven, one verse, and listen to what he has for you every morning, in the afternoon, at night. You can do it three times a day. Pray with a focus on this verse and just listen to what God has for you. And here's the one other thing I want you to do. I'm gonna close reading from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Now, this is obviously in the New Testament. It's written by Paul. Um, It's years and years and years after Jeremiah wrote this letter to the exiles. A lot has changed historically, including the fact that Jesus has already come, died, risen again, and is now ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty in heaven. A lot has changed. But Paul writes this, telling us what love in action looks like. And as you are praying, Jeremiah 29, 11, Would you read these passages also? Would you read these verses also and allow this to inform the creative, your your creativity as you you, uh, seek to understand what it means to seek the peace and prosperity of God in the city? Listen to these words. I'm going to say amen and then we're going to be done. Paul says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Thanks for being part of our service today. If you're new to Willowdale Online, or if you've been tuning in for a while, we want you to know that we would love to see you in person. We gather as a church family every Sunday on both campuses at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And if you're considering checking us out for the first time, you can plan your visit by clicking the I'm New button on our website. If you let us know that you're coming, we'll have someone from our hospitality team ready to greet you and show you around. Also, if you haven't already done so, I want to invite you to download our app where you can learn more about all the fun opportunities that we have this summer to help you get connected into our community. Check it out. Now, as you go, be reminded of these words from Jeremiah 29, seven. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. May this be the cry of your heart and the call on your life. Have a great week.